I teach and do research in soil science and in digital agriculture, and maybe, maybe some people wouldn't see a, a strong relationship between those. But when Lakeisha talked earlier about um, what was the arrival point, the arrival point for me for agriculture is environmentally equilibrated, decommoditized, and value-added and connected agriculture. That, to me, is where we're headed. And that will be achieved through digitalization, largely, I think. But anyway, I'm not here to talk about that today. But that will give you soil health and sustainability for sure. So one size doesn't fit all. Um, I acknowledge my co-authors, Damien Field um, from the University of Sydney and Christine Morgan, late of Texas A&M University and now with the wonderful Soil Health Institute. So what does this talk mean? Uh, I think uh, Libby explained in the last talk what it meant. Actually, she explained it to you. So, But um, let's see if we can go through it. Um, it's, it's just this idea that uh, um, if you go around the world and look at uh, different situations with different soils, so here's something that we work on uh, in New Guinea, uh, north of Australia, Andesols, volcanic soils, still under shifting cultivations, low input systems, uh, but highly productive systems producing a range of crops, but largely for not commodities, but for people to actually eat. Uh, this is a typical Australian example, um, and I've tried to turn it into American language. Rhodostalfs or rhodoziralfs uh, under crop production. Um, this is the typical soil we have for most of our grain belt. And I'd I just like to report to you that in, in our cropping systems, we have more than 90% conservation agriculture. It's just the thing you do in Australia. It's because of this dry climate, so it's, it's, it's very common to have that there. But we still have soil issues, even though we have conservation agriculture everywhere. We still have issues about carbon. But it's a different kind of soil. And then, of course, you probably spotted from my accent, it's not completely Australian. Uh, this is where I was brought up. You see that soil there on the right there? That's why I'm only five foot two. Because uh, <laughs> if you're going to make a living off that thing. <laughs> anyway, what I, what I want to say about that one is it's quite sustainable. Those soils have been producing pastures and animals and cropping for more than 2,000 years. And they're still there. And I don't think there's any danger of them disappearing. But even there, we can improve the situation. So all I'm trying to say is, um, when we're, when we're working on this stuff, we, need to, we, we don't want absolute guidelines. We need relative guidelines for the situation and for the locality. And I think that's what Libby was saying in the previous talk. I have worked with Christine and Damien on a concept called global soil security. I note, I note the title of this conference, Soil Health, a Global Imperative. I, I, I'm going to split hairs. It's the same, it's the same idea we're, we're working on doing this for the world and making it an important issue for the world. Um, and when I look at it, somebody said this morning, there are these things that they're called, that are noble. I think it was the secretary uh, from the department here. And I talk about these global existential challenges. I call them the, the noble challenges, actually, of food and water and energy, climate, human health. They're all interlinked, but there is Another one in there that links them all up, and that is what I've called soil security. And I think there's a nexus of these seven uh, global challenges. And uh, I think it's imperative that we, we get soil health or soil security at the same level as these other challenges, recognized by humanity, by the common people, that this is just as important as, as any of those other ones. And they're all linked together. That's the important message I want to give. When we look at soil security, we look at some dimensions. Um, a couple of them are biophysical. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But there are other dimensions, capital, the economic dimension, the connectivity, the social dimension, connecting people to soil and soil to people, so important. More than 50% of the world is now urbanized. The, the, so that 
breaks that con connection to soil, and we have to build that back again. That's why I think a decommoditized digital agriculture can do that for us and bring that back. And then, of course, policy and governance, which has the horrible word of codification, but I couldn't think of another one that began with C. Uh, <laughs> now, what soil can do, soil functions, and this is, this is the list that you get from the European Union, and, and we need to understand it's not just about agriculture, it's not just about biomass production, there's a whole set of functions that soil can do. This list is from about 20 years ago. I think we should actually sit down and actually redo this soil function list, because it, it needs to be tidied up, I think. Now that we understand ecosystem services as well, we could do a better job of this. But that's the one that's kind of used around the world at the moment. So if we want to evaluate soil security, we've got five dimensions and seven functions. So we actually need to do 35 evaluations of a particular thing to figure out what's the level of secu security around any soil in any situation. That's a challenge. But that's a challenge I've given myself and my colleagues to work out ways of quantifying all of that. That's what we're about. We want to quantify all of that so that we can manage the situation. And we've done um, rough quantifications for states like Tasmania. Uh, and, and the other thing about this quantification, it needs to be spatial, it needs to be mappable, and it needs to be mappable at the level of farms so that people can manage at the level of farms. So that's the important thing. So I'll give you a little example, and here we are. We're talking about vineyard soils later. Here we are close to uh, Napa Valley. So I thought I'd talk about the Hunter Valley, which is one of our prime wine growing areas, just north of Sydney. Uh, fairly harsh climate for growing uh, wines, and it's getting hotter there as well. Um, but uh, we produce very high quality, very high value semi young and Shiraz wines there, as well as others. Um, and the semi young is the classic wine of that area. And it's, it's actually world class, probably one of the best semi youngs in the world. I won't worry about that. So here's this area. And the area outlined is actually a, a private irrigation district. It's an, actually an irrigation area. They, they put on about 100 mils of, oh, I, got, I don't know what that is in feet, poundals or whatever units you use, but 100 millimetres of rainfall <laughs> of, of, of irrigation water just to get through, through the driest part of the season. Anyway, um, we've got this area and we can map out the soils. So we use, we use that equation there to map out the soils. So if you're an ecologist, you should learn that equation. Um, it works for soils. Um, and it just says that soil's a function of soil, climate, rainfall, relief pr precipitation, how old it is, and some other contextual things. Uh, but what I've done here is I have used the pre-settlement vegetation for the, o the o organisms or the vegetation to map this out. So you map out the soil using pre-settlement vegetation, and then you bring in the current land use on top of that to split up the soils that are similar. Uh, and so you can split the soils up into these different kinds of soils. And then we've got the geno soil, which is the one that, that's under the pre-settlement uh, vegetation. And then pheno soils, depending on the land use, uh, going from uh, uh, pasture to vineyards and so on. So it's a way of splitting up the landscape. And based on that, we can then estimate some things about soil change in that landscape. So I'm, I've got an equation here. Capability is capacity and condition. Capability, ability to perform a soil function. Capacity is that component of that that's difficult to change by human activity, and condition is a function that is easily changed by human activity. And so capability equals capacity and condition. In American, we could say quality equals capacity plus health. Uh, might be similar, might be the same, it's the same thing. But I wouldn't be so presumptuous as to say that. Um, so we can estimate these quantities for a given soil of interest and its reference soil to gauge change and target for recovery. Uh, 
And the target will depend on the reference soil, so it's this localized idea. And that's where I'm saying one size doesn't fit all. We know from the reference soil what is possible in this location. Uh, there's a full example of this on a poster out there entitled Soil Capability, Capacity and Condition. It's poster three. It's one of those nice cloth posters that you can put in your suitcase. It looks like that. So when we map them out, so here are the red chromosomes, which are oh, uh, rhodostalfs. So the genosoil, blue, and then you get into the, the different land uses on this same soil. So there is some remnant vegetation, remnant pre-settlement vegetation still in this area. So that allows us to compare what's happening under these different land uses. And this is the same for the calcarosols. The calcarosols are the ones with their calcic uh, bee horizons. Of course, they're highly prized for growing Shiraz. They're just like French soils. And we can calculate uh, all of this kind of stuff. But if you just look at that one, it's, hard, it's a bit hard to read, but you can see that uh, in the, in the, for these red curasols, the carbon content in the native vegetation is 4.1, and in the vineyard it's about 2.4. So you can see immediately what a, a target could be for this climate in this area for increasing carbon. Whether you need to or not, if, you, if you're looking at it from sequestration, there's a possibility to increase carbon. So you know, what you, you know for that kind of soil what your target can be. And, that, and th that's the main concept here, that when we do this thing, we do it relative to some reference. Um, we can plot the tra traje that's a hard word, isn't it? trajectory so <laughs> of soil change in this space. This is all the variables, and you can see how the soils are changing from... Uh, uh, if you follow the arrows, the, the ones at the beginning are the genosoils, the ones under the natural vegetation, and then as you move along, they're moving to pastures and then to vineyards, and they go in a, a certain sequence, so, which, lets, which gives me faith in that this, this methodology uh, kind of works. And basically, in ecological uh, literature terms, we're using space for time substitution to do this uh, estimation here. Now, for the U.S., because I, I, you know, I like to help when I can, uh, for the U.S., this kind of analysis could be facilitated by a couple of things that are out there at the moment, the Polaris soil series probabilities and Polaris plus soil properties, and there's a whole set of remotely sensed USGS, USGS land use time series. So if you put that together... And that they're available in 30-meter digital grids. You could actually do this kind of evaluation in many, everywhere or in many places. So I think it's quite possible to do this kind of uh, estimation. So just f f finishing up. Um, so what, what I presented there was a, a simple way of using local information of calculating capability and condition and recognizing reference soils uh, locally. Um, and there are two of the five dimensions of soil security, or not, which I've called here soil health and security, which I like, I like the term soil health and security, because I think it goes to, it goes to uh, people and to governments. Um, and it feeds into these other global existential challenges and as we heard from the secretary earlier, it feeds into at least seven of the sustainable development goals. But in the future, I want soil security itself to be one of the sustainable development goals. Thank you. That's, that's what we should be working towards. We should be working towards international recognition of soil itself being uh, vital to the future of humanity on the planet. And I've got one minute left, so to conclude, uh, we developed a way of segregating the landscape, or the watershed as you guys might call it, for any location. A reference state can be defined and located. This facilitates estimation of capability and condition, and the optimal re remediation management depends on the soil property values for the reference state. They give you a clue 
So therefore, one size does not fit all. Thank you very much.